Hello, John. Hi there. <laughs> uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is class number 16 uh, out of 20. And this is Dick Robaugh, and he's going to tie tiny flies for us today. So, Dick, take it away. Okay. Um... <clears throat> That's somebody's. Uh, that was somebody's. Came on and was okay. really loud. <laughs> so let me uh, let me comment about why uh, I have chosen to tie these flies tonight. Um, I tie flies to go fishing, and so um, I I tie. I tie full dress Atlantic salmon oh, flies when I want to have just fun okay. time. But most of the other flies that I tie, Nick, uh, some people <laughs> have got something uh, on. Hang on, let me get, let me mute them. Sure, yeah, some... you can mute everybody, I believe. I think I did. Okay, now go again. Okay, uh, while I tie artistic flies. Uh, for the fun of it, most of the trout flies I tie, I actually fish with. And um, about 20 years ago, I got into fishing with uh, tiny flies. Uh, the guy that got me into it was Craig Matthews. Some of you know he owned ribbon flies in West Yellowstone. Craig is my neighbor in Montana, and we fish together a lot. Craig is, uh, to say that Craig is into midge fishing is an understatement. And about 20 years ago, Craig got me into it and I discovered that uh, you can catch a lot of fish on dry, tiny midges, both in the river and the lakes. All of the flies that I'm gonna tie tonight, I fish both in rivers and lakes. Um, some of them are river hatches that float down into the top of, of lakes where the river runs into the lake at the head of it. Um, and they are really river flies. That's true of betas. But uh, others hatch both in rivers and lakes. Midges, for example. We have big midge hatches on the Madison uh, River. We have big mad midge hatches on Hebgen Lake. We have big midge hatches on Quake Lake, Ennis Lake. So midges are both river and lake flies, but um, the, the uh, trichos uh, are primarily a, a lake fly or very slow moving rivers. And uh, the betas are of course a river fly that ends up at the top of lakes. So all of these, all three of the flies we're gonna tie tonight, I fish with a great deal. On the Madison River, for example, There'll be caddis hatchers, let's say in July in the evening and the caddis emergence will occur about an hour before dark, maybe an hour and a half. But then as it gets to the last 20 minutes before dark, you will see the rise forms on the river change. Instead of the splashy rises after emerging caddis, all of a sudden you'll see the fish move into the quiet eddies on, along the shore and you'll see the sipping and head and tail rises, and you know they've switched to midges. So late in the evening, right before dark, I fish midges on the river. On the lakes, like Quake Lake, for example, there is a huge midge hatch that happens shortly after the, the sunrise, and it will last till maybe 10 o'clock. Then there's another midge hatch that occurs at four o'clock in the afternoon. So there are two opportunities on Quake Lake to fish midges. Um, on Hebgen, we have quite a variety of midge hatches. Uh, there is a midge that hatches in late May and early June that's size 14. That's, that's huge, that's the biggest midge I've ever seen. But most of the summer, there are small midges um, available. And so midges are one thing we're after. But an, another thing that we're after, uh, obviously, I've got to get to my right, the right slide here, is trichos. Uh, trichos hatch on um, lakes and on slow-moving streams. 
that come out in enormous numbers, but not many people realize that there is a big difference between the male trico and the female trico. The male trichos hatch in the evening and they hover along the shore of the lake all evening, clouds of them. On Hebgen Lake, you'd think there's fog on the, on the edges of the lake. Uh, and they are there all night. And then the females hatch in the morning. There will be mating flights. And then there's a spinner fall. The females don't look anything like the males. The males are tiny. They're black and white. I'll show you what a midge looks like in, a, in just a minute. Uh, I'm sorry, what a female trico looks like in, in just a second. 90% of the trico fishing we do is with female trichos in the morning, starting at about eight o'clock in the morning and lasting an hour, an hour and a half. And then betas. Uh, one of the things it's important to recognize about betas, the blue wing olive, is that like a number of mayflies, betas are multi-brooded. And what that means is, that there will be a hatch of betas, uh, let's say, on the Madison River in late April and early May. And those betas will be a size 16. But those uh, flies will lay eggs, and the, the eggs they lay will hatch in se late September and October. And because they have a short time all summer to grow, they're tiny. So the fall betas are 20 and 22. When they lay eggs, those eggs grow all winter long and they will be the larger betas in the spring. So what I'm gonna uh, concentrate on today are the tiny betas that are in the fall that hatch in the rivers, but flow down into the tops of the lakes where we can pick them up. Uh, heavy, heavy rises uh, fish feeding the, on them. So the first fly that I wanna tie uh, is this one. Now, I tied this originally as a trico and beta spinner. But what I discovered was that this will also catch fish during a midge hatch. Now, Matt, that may seem odd to you because midges do not have tails. Uh, the trico and the, and the uh, beta spinners do, but I discovered the fish ignore that when there's a, a midge hatch. And I catch, I, I told Sherry, everybody would be a little surprised. I catch more fish on this fly during a summer than any other fly I tie. I use it all summer long, late evening when there's a midge emergence in the river. I use it all summer long when there's a midge emergence on the lake. But let me talk about the two bugs that I originally tied this for. This is a beta spinner. You can see it has the typical clear wings, the long tails. The body is thin, and it's a very dark olive. Uh, in the fall, these will be 20 and 22s. Now let's go over here to the female trico. You remember that the male trico is black and white. The female trico is not. The back half of the body is, is olive and the front half is dark brown. Notice also that this is a relatively short body compared to how tall the wings are. These wings, this is a size 18 uh, when it hatches. Uh, the wings are close to a 16 in size. The bodies are fat, these are thin. The fish don't seem to care. This one fly will catch all of them. So that's the first fly we're going to tie, and I'm going to tie it in a size 22. That would mean I'm tying it primarily for the fall betas, and uh, I'm going to tie it small, even though you don't always have to fish it this small. I'm going to tie it small because I want to show you that it's really no harder to tie tiny flies than it is big flies. The one thing that's critical with small flies is you want very simple patterns and very durable materials. You don't want to be having to tie 20 of them for a day's fishing, so you hope they'll last, but they have to be fairly simple. 
And this is the simplest fly I know how to tie. So I'm tying with black eight odd thread. A lot of people think when you tie a 22, you have to go to a 14 or a 12 thread, not necessary. Works perfectly well with eight. And that's what I'm using uh, today. Now the first material that I'm gonna use is crystal flash. Let me switch this other camera and put it down on my tying table. And you can see the, the crystal flash. Uh, pretty familiar to most people. Um, when I originally tied this fly, I, I tied it with um, hackle fibers. But I discovered over time that um, tying it with crystal flash is easier. It works just as well, if not better, as a kind of an attractor material. And uh, Dick, Dick, you need to switch cameras. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm keeping track of you. <laughs> yeah. So what I did is I just doubled a piece of the crystal flash, tied it on, wrapped back to the back of the of the shank, and clip it off. You don't really need to worry about separating this because if you just give it a little pull on either side, it'll separate just fine. So uh, now we've got a, 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 a tail on it. And I remind you again that uh, midges do not have tails. And the fish do not care. Um, I'm looking for the next next material. The next material I'm going to use is Zelon. Now, when Craig Math, this is by the way a takeoff of a Craig Matthews pattern. When Craig tied it, he tied it with a Zelon shuck, and he calls it a Zelon midge, and he still ties it that way. I changed the tail material. I think it attracts better, at least on the lake, particularly. Um, and I'm going to tie with. Uh, just a piece of Zelon, and I've cut down the, the strand of it to about half size. So I'll come up here to the front of the hook, and I'm just going to tie this on. And then figure eight it. So we just get it figure eighted about like that. You can see that on there. Then pull it straight up and lean it back and clip it off about the a little more than the, the hook shank. And what that'll give you is something that looks like this. Now, I actually change the length of the wings depending on which bug I'm tying it for. If I'm tying this for a, a, a beta spinner, I tie the, the cut the wings longer than this. If I cut am tying this for a midge, I cut them very short because midges have very short wings. Uh, th this about in the middle is tied the way I would tie it for a, a, a uh, beta. Now, the only other step to this fly is a tiny amount, whoops. I twisted my, my wing. Is a tiny amount of, of dubbing for the body. And I'm gonna come back here. I like, with any small fly, you wanna make your dubbing noodle as thin as you can. It does not take very much. I'm just going to wrap a body starting here at the back. And as I work my way forward, what I'm going to do is figure eight that wing.
Like Z Lines getting caught in the wing. There we go. So that I've I've figureated it and it ends up looking like that. I got some extraneous hairs sticking out here. Then I'll just bring the uh, thread back up to the front when I clean this up. Pull the wing back and whip finish. And that's all there is to this fly. Uh, it's about as easy to tie as anything you can imagine. It's difficult to see on the water because it's so small, but on a lake where um, the, the water is pretty glassy, it's actually not all that hard to see. I want to show you something. I got a new whip finisher. This is made by Loon. And look at the at the the end of it. Do you see the? It's got a blade at the bottom of it. I just push that against the fit the thread and I don't have to go get my scissors. So there's a little fly that'll work as a beta spinner, as a mayfly or as a uh, trico spinner, and it even works as a midge. Now that's so easy to tie and it's so durable that um, I mean what more could you ask for? Let me ask if there are questions about that particular fly. Yeah, if you guys have a question, just unmute yourself. Um, a comment more than a question. You said you'd used it both for the betas and the trico, or excuse me, the trico and the midges. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen the reverse operate where I was fishing with a friend and he ran out of tricos and he used a midge and it works. So, I mean, the, you get into the small black flies and fish are focused on small black flies and- uh, That's it, exactly it correct. It works. They, they work, they're interchangeable. Actually, I was reading recently uh, uh, one of the latest studies on trout vision and I was actually surprised. They have decided that trout don't see very well. Uh, they tend to see in silhouette and they don't see colors on the surface very readily. They just see in silhouette. So small black flies work for quite a variety of things. That's correct. So the statement of size, shape, and then color is a sequence of what works with flies pretty well fits that description. It really does. You know, I, I ran an experiment one time just for the fun of it. Um, I, I was fishing a PMD hatch and I was using a sparkle gun with a yellow body. And just for the fun of it, I tied it with a gray, a brown, a green, and a pink body. Didn't make a whit of difference. <laughs> Not a bit. Um, so color, I'm among those convinced that color doesn't really matter that much. Um, size and profile do. I'll tell you a size story. I was fishing one evening in front of my house. I, I live all summer on the Madison River. And I was fishing in front of the house and I was catching fish. And I, ha I was fishing with a size 16 uh, iris or uh, X caddis. And I had a big fish on and two guys came floating by in a boat and they pulled over to watch as I landed the fish. And they asked me, what the heck did you catch that on? And I said, a caddis. And they said, we've been fishing caddis all evening and have yet to get a single strike. I said, what size were you using? They said, 14. I was fishing a 16 and I had fish all evening. <laughs> so size matters. Um, so, so now let's go to the second fly that we're gonna tie. And this one is primarily aimed at midges. Uh, I should have gone over this with the last fly. I, I'm gonna use either a Daiichi 1130, a Tem, TMCO 2487, 
and I tie this in 18 to 22. The one I'm going to tie tonight, I'll tie a 20. And I can tie it in black, olive, or green thread. And I do that because uh, we have midges, we have midges on Ennis Lake that are bright green. We have midges on uh, uh, Ennis Lake that are red. And the midges on Hebgen Lake are black. So I tie it in all three colors. But uh, here, by the way, is a good look at an, at an actual midge. Notice that midges have rather long bodies, but rather short wings. And for their size, they have rather long legs. And they're rather bulky, so to, relatively up at the front, and they're very thin at the back. Um, so in that respect, they're configured quite differently than mayflies are. So we're going to use, I'm going to use black thread tonight. Uh, for the body, we need to, uh, I'm, I'm just going to use the thread. That's, I, you can use super fine dubbing if you want, but I'll show you how to do it with just the thread. We're going to rib the body. I can rib it in fine silver. Sometimes I rib, the, rib, it, rib it with a very fine red wire. Uh, or sometimes a very fine green wire. Tonight, I'm actually going to do it with a contrasting thread. Then we've got a wing on this fly, and I'm going to use sparkle uh, done deer hair. And then we have a hackle, and I'm going to be using dun tonight, though I use black or grizzly for some of the patterns. So um, let me get a hook in the, in the vise. And I'm going to be tying this tonight on a size 20 Daiichi 1130. Okay, could you move your camera to the vise? I will do that. Boy, that is tiny. <laughs> yeah, it's tiny. <laughs> now, I need to think a little bit about how I put this hook in the vise. As you can see, it's kind of low in the vise right now, and that's going to be a problem because I want to be able to tie right at the very, uh, down the bend of the hook. So I've got to reposition this and put it rather high in my vise. Can you see now? Less of the hook is in the vise and um, more of the hook is out. So again, I'll, I'm going to be using black 80 thread. There is no need to go to a smaller thread than that. Oh, what I'm, I'm going to use uh, when I can find it on. Let me switch my tying table for a minute. I thought I had a piece of thread cut, but I can't find it. So I'm just going to be using a piece of white thread. And we're going to do our ribbing with that. So it's just, just a skinny piece of white thread. Now let me go back to the, the camera with the hook. And... Uh, and I drop the thread. I get another piece. So I just want to tie this on like you would anything else. Pull it back. Now I'm going to wrap all the way down. The, all the way down the hook. And as you can see, I'm coming down around the bend of the hook. Whoop. I want to get down there a little bit farther. Now I'm just going to wrap the thread back up the whole length of the hook. up to about there. Now I'm going to use this thread to put the rib on. And 
do it just like any other old rib. Just wrap it up the, the body and you can see it spirals very nicely. And creates a rib that looks like that. Now, the, the next material we're going to use is sparkled on deer hair. Um, you want to find, for uh, flies this small, you want to find the thinnest diameter sparkled on hair you can find. Bulky hair will make a mess of this fly. So I don't know if you can see this, but I've got pretty thin Yeah, that looks good. Here. I'm going to take a little batch of this and I emphasize the word little. Um, that's not even as thick as a match. Just a few hairs is all it takes. And I'm going to stack that. I, I've got a broken tip in there that I don't want to get out. Now, if I, I, I one next, I want to measure the wing, and I want the wing uh, no longer than the hook, which is pretty darn short. But if I tie this on like this, trust me, you will make a mess. So what you need to do is you need to clip it off right in front of your fingers like that. Then lay that down on the top of the hook. Come over the top of it with a loose wrap, then some tight ones. And you get that little tiny wing on the back. It's critical that you not try to tie that on and then cut it off. It just does not work, trust me. Well, the last thing we're gonna put on this fly is a hackle. And I, I've, got a, I've got a saddle hackle. It's a whiting saddle hackle. I'll show it to you. It's got gorgeous size 20 feathers on it. Mm. So we're going to put a few wraps of hackle on this. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to spread the fibers on the hackle and I'm not going to pull them off. I'm going to clip them right at the next to the stem because I want something that will, can you see that? Yeah. Can you see the fibers? I want something here that will capt capture the thread. So then we'll tie this in. And give it a couple wraps. That's enough. Flip that off and we'll finish it. So it's a little more complex than the last fly, but it's not all that hard to tie. Again, with that blade, I can just, I trapped a couple of fibers, but they go bye-bye. And there's my little midge merger. I've got one here I want to show you. Can you see this one? I 
I don't know if it'll show up very well. I can see it. Uh, it's, I, I ribbed the body with a fine red wire. Do you see that? Yep. I don't know if it's in focus. So you can vary the body colors by... Um, Changing, changing the rib. Um, I usually clip the bottom of this. Midge bodies float flat on the water. So I usually clip that off like that. And there I've got a nice little midge emerger. Any questions so, about that fly? How do you know when to use this fly? Um, to be really honest, it's sort of when the mood strikes. <laughs> because the other fly will catch rising fish on midges. Uh, I probably use this one a little more on the river because it's easier to see than the flat wing one. So I, I tend to use the the first one I tied, the spinner one, I tend to use that more on the lake uh, than I do on the river. But on the river in the evening, I use this just because I can see it better. But you put any, black do you black. put any floating on it? I'm sorry? Do you put any floating on it? Absolutely. This one yes. floats right on, right on top. Okay. I put floating on both of them, by the way. I'm 99% a dry fly fisherman. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it was the way I was taught to fish. I, I, I can't remember if I told this group, I told one of them. I was taught to fish by Dan ba Bailey. Uh, Dan and my uncle were best friends and Dan considered anybody who fished wet flies an inferior creature. <laughs> so, um, he, insist, he taught my brother and I to fish and he insisted we learn to fish dry flies. And I learned how to do it. And I am actually not that good with wet flies or nymphs because I've done this for my whole life. So yeah, all the, all, fl all the flies you will see tonight are dry flies with floating and fish on top. So that's the second one. Any other questions? Okay, let's go to our last fly. Now, I wanna go back to my PowerPoint here and show you this one. Uh, I tie this as a betis cripple. One of the reasons I do, there are several kinds of mayflies that cripple a great deal. PMDs cripple badly. And sometimes the fish will key in on the cripples and won't take the duns. That's also true of betas, the blue wing olive. And a lot of people get frustrated when they're throwing good flies, making good presentations on betas, and they can't catch a fish, even though they're rising fish everywhere. Sometimes the reason for that is the fish have keyed on the cripples. And when they do, they will not take a dun. So you need to have, if you're fishing blue wing olive hatches, you need to have a cripple pattern with you. And this is the cripple pattern that I use the most. Now, you notice that this fly has a black wing. And you may wonder why. The reason it does is because in the fall, these flies are very tiny. They're 20 and 22. Black is by far the easiest color to see on the water. And it may surprise you, but the later it gets and the darker it gets, the easier it is to see black over against any other color. And that's why with these, I tie them with a black wing. I've discovered it works perfectly well. I can see it easier. So that's the way we're gonna do it. So uh, I'm going to tie this uh, this fly on a size 20, and I'm going to be using 
I'm actually using a TMCO 5210. A Daiichi 1170 will work just as well. Any other standard fly uh, hook. I like the two extra long because this fly has a few materials on it. Dick, you want to change your camera again? <laughs> I got two cameras working and I can't remember to switch back and forth. So that's that's a TM hook of uh, 52 TM. It's a size 20. By the way, this uh, software program that I have allows me to zoom so I can move the camera. I can move the fly way up in the picture. If I were to to uh, do this unzoomed, you would hardly be able to see that. So it looks bigger than it actually is. But uh, it is, trust me, it's a size 20. Now this time I'm going to use um, green thread. Um, the, the trico, let me go back to that. I want to show you that again. I can't remember if I might have misspoken a minute ago. You see the, the female trico, olive green on the back and brown on the front? That's what we're going to be. I may have said I was using this. Oh, I use this for baits too. I'm going to tie it. Oh, if I were using this. Um, for, for a female trico. So I'm using green thread. And... Um, you got to switch your camera again. Oh, gosh. <laughs> this is really, really clear. It's really what? clear. It's a very clear image. Good. I'm going to tie a shuck at the back of this. And I'm, I'm using Zilon. And I'm using only about a third of a strand. If you try to use a full strand of it, you're going to make kind of a mess. So the back half of it uh, is is green, and all I'm going to use in the back is just the thread. Then I'm going to come up here to the front, and I'm going to put a little cover the rest of the hook, basically, with dark brown dubbing. And I'm going to wrap it back to about there. Then I'm going to uh, take some EP fibers. You guys are all familiar with this stuff. Uh, I'm using the original trigger point work just as well. Maybe better. And I'm going to tie a cripple wing on that. And clip that off, leaving a little bit of a nub back there. I want to stand that up a little bit. And I usually wrap the base of it a couple times to kind of gather those fibers together. That's maybe a little long. Are you guys are familiar with what cripples look like. Uh, then we're going to get our size 20 hackle going again. A lot of people think you can't tie something as uh, with as many materials as a cripple has on a size 20, but you can. So once again, what I've done is I've clipped the fibers at the bottom. I have not stripped them. 
we'll wrap that on a couple of times there, bring our thread to the front. And you remember that when you're tying hackles both in front and behind a wing, you want the diameter of the body in front of the wing to be nearer to the diameter in back. Couple of wraps in the back, pull the wing back. Couple of wraps in the front. Tie it off. Uh, whip finish. It's really easy on these tiny flies to catch fibers, but they're easily trimmed. Now what I'm going to do on this one again is I'm going to trim off the bottom. I want this to sit down on the water. So there is my black wing cripple. Can you see that? Yeah. The camera images are excellent. Good. They show every little hair out of place. Yes, maybe the negative, who knows. <laughs> so you can see it clearly. I use I tie it that way uh, as a female trico. I tie it that way for a betis cripple. I see, again, little black flies that work. And trust me, that black wing just shows up even late in the evening. I can see that very clearly on the river. Dick, do you tie all your cripples with black or just the ones that are going to be late in the evening, dark? Uh, pretty much just the ones that are late in the evening. And uh, actually, not just the, the cripples. Uh, I've gotten so I tie X caddis with black wings. Uh, because late in the evening, cat, you know, caddis, when you're fishing caddis earlier in the afternoon, you're really fishing egg layers. Uh, caddis hatch right before dark. And as it begins to get dark, they get harder and harder to see on the surface. So I tie X caddis with using EP fibers again for a wing, and I, I tie them in black so that I can see them on the water. So anything that I'm going to fish late in the evening, I, I use black on it. Just so much easier to see. One other question about the cripple. Do you put floating on it? And if so, do you put it on the whole fly or just part of it? Um, on the, I don't know if you were watching when I did the Calibatus program, but on the Calibatus program, I try to get, uh, let me switch the other camera here a second. Uh, it fell over. When, when I'm fishing the Calibatus one, I want it to float tail down, a uh, shock down in the water like that because I've spent a lot of time looking at, at emerging Calavetus on Hebgen Lake, and that's in fact the way the cripples float. Um, the, the Betis cripples don't, they float flat. So with the Betis cripples, I put floating on the whole fly. With the Calavetus ones, I just put it on the hackle and wing so they'll, 
the shuck will be underwater. So what I'm trying to do is match the behavior with PMDs. Um, PMD cripples tend to float flatter than calabatus do. So with a PMD cripple, I, I put floating on the whole fly. Uh, what, what else do I fish that cripples? They're the, they're the three biggest cripplers are PMDs, calabatus, and betas. Made some observations I've not seen, and that's great to know. I never, didn't realize cripples didn't float anyway, but down and, and uh, straggle. So the yeah, the, the, betas, betas. the betas cripples don't float that way. Uh, I'm Greg Matthews, and I have spent a lot of time with collecting nets, seining the surface, looking for these things. Um, and I'm pretty confident I can say that the beta, beta cripples float flat. You just remind me of one other thing that people in the group might know, but to get a, a seine that you could use while you're fishing. Yes. And a friend of mine tell me you can go to Home Depot and buy a paint strainer, get them for like two for five bucks and they get a large one, fits over your net. And then you just turn your net into a strainer and you can see what's coming down the river. It works a lot. I have just a small one and I with on two rods that I can roll up and stick in my vest. But I spent a lot of time on Ennis Lake and on uh, Quake Lake saning the midge hatch to try to figure out what the devil they were taking because I couldn't see it. And um, after some hours doing with that, I finally figured it out. And last summer, I caught a lot of fish on that first fly I tied. There will be a bunch tied up before the night's over, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and any other questions? Yeah. Still Lovelace. Yes. Have you uh, tied this cripple in, in one of Gallup's single wing cripple styles? Uh, the only way I've tied it is the way I've done it tonight. But if there are other ways to tie it, they're worth trying. Just be sure that the pattern you're using is simple enough that you can tie it this small. I, I've tried to tie several patterns that are fairly elaborate and flies this small and it's, it ain't worth the effort. I can do it, but it ain't worth the effort. So this cripple is fairly simple and I can tie it small quickly. Any other questions? Uh, Just this one, one other comment on the uh, betas. Uh, I found on Silver Creek that morning uh, egg laying flight of the uh, of the females, the females tend to be one size larger than the uh, male. Yeah. So your females like the 22 and the males like the 20. And after the egg laying, you had a male spinner fall and there was a distinct change between color and size you know, in about a half hour there or so. And we've also got great trichos on uh, on the Owyhee River. Well, I can tell you that on Hebgen Lake, where I fish uh, trichos, the male trichos are a, a very small 22, but the females are a healthy 18. Wow, they're so different. Yeah, they're, they're just very different. And, and as a result, the spinners are different. So the tiny little black and white spinners on Hebgen Lake, the male ones, tend to get ignored by the fish. They tend to key on the larger size 18 female spinners. Um, with betas, I'm, I'm not aware if there's a size difference in the two genders. One, one question on your females in the morning trico. 
Do you fish just the spinner fall or do you try to fish the female done hatch uh, before? Actually, the... actually I, I actually catch fish on both. And I probably catch more on the with the done than I do with the spinners. And part of the reason for that um, is the, the, the spinner fall of trichos on Hebgen Lake is so massive, there are millions of them. And your fly can't compete very well with that. With the duns, there are fewer of them. I can still fish the spinner pattern if I want to, because they'll take they'll take that. But I catch more on uh, the, during the dun hatch with trichos than I do with the spinner hatch, because the they're just clouds of spinners coming down. It's this may sound silly, but uh, sometimes it's worth paddling away from an area where there are too many bugs just because your fly can't compete on, on Hebgen Lake. Uh, you get where there are fewer bugs and you have a better chance of competing with the natural. Well, a personal story very quickly to have everybody understand when you talk about the numbers of trichos, I caught this hatch on the bighorn one year and I think anybody who's fished stoneflies has felt the belly of a fish that is full of stoneflies, and you can literally feel the insects inside the fish. I had that same experience with bighorn trout on a trico hatch. Absolutely. That's how much they were consuming the trico. Well, it'll, it'll, I, I don't know that you can feel them, but I've used this stomach pump and pumped this the stomach of fish during midge hatches, and it's shocking. The hundreds of midges in inside a single fish. So don't discount small flies. They get eaten in large numbers. And you talk about the bighorn, it's a good example. It has great, great trico hatches. The upper big hole does. Um, the Madison, they're pretty sparse. Um, the water is too fast, but on Ennis, on Hebgen Lake, the midge hatch is so heavy, you'd swear to God there's fog over the water. Just millions of them. So it and it brings a lot of big fish up. I think I I can't remember if I told you this the last program I did, but. The biologists don't know the reason, but the fish on Hebgen Lake are getting bigger and more numerous. The average size of the fish on, he on Hebgen Lake now is 18 to 22 inches. But I caught a 26 inch brown on that little spinner pattern I showed you <laughs> wow. the first fly tonight. That doesn't move you, you're stone cold dead. I think I need to get busy. <laughs> like John Kreft says, TikTok. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Hi, Jerry. I see you're here. Yeah, I had to uh, come up on my phone. Oh. I'm glad my, you uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I made it. I, I didn't get to see the end of the black wing one, though, but it's okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna post these online on the YouTube channel, so it's coming. What um, is it? What is it? What is it posted under, Sherry? I'll have to send everybody a link. Okay. And it's but you there. have the pattern sheet for this one, right? For this one. Yes, I sent it to you. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah I'll, I I I I'll, I can get it from there. Hey, Dick, do you use um, uh, sometimes on that on those flies? You use that heavy the heavier uh curved hook do you use the heavier one just the to let it one. Yeah, no I'm, i don't uh on that curved hook one i showed you tonight i use the lighter weight one because i'm floating it okay okay uh all of the flies i tied tonight i fish dry yeah okay all right I, before you got on i was telling the story of how craig matthews who's a good friend of mine i we fish together a lot about 20 years ago, he turned me on to dry fly fishing with tiny flies. Yeah, okay. And I catch more fish now on that first tiny midge pattern than any 
any fly I fish all summer. Yeah. Okay. All of them, I float all of them. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm smoking while I was tying, gotten the trico and the betas thing mixed up. But as somebody pointed out, um, any of these flies will work for midges. Any of these will work for trichos. Any of them will work for betas because okay. small dark colored flies all look pretty much the same when you're looking up at silhouette. Uh, we okay. see the fish see them. So any of them will work for any of them. Okay. Yeah, they're gorgeous. Well, I guess we're going to have to get busy. Uh, we had 37 people join the show tonight. So it's a nice group. And uh, Dick, thank you so much. I know you've worked really hard to get the camera thing straightened out. And uh, he's going to train me now <laughs> so I can get the that I'll new software. Before I quit, I'll show you what I tie when I'm just tying for fun. Oh, I'd like to see that. There we go. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dick has an idea that we might uh, kickstart Salmon Fly Saturdays this next winter mm -hmm. uh, because we used to do that together over in Salem. And uh, that's where I met Dick, is tying these beauties. And uh, so we've decided we might uh, start the Salmon Fly Saturdays thing again and uh, make it uh, a totally different venue. But the other thing that uh, uh, Dick and I talked about for our future meetings is to do a multiple presenter skill set. So you wanna talk more about that, Dick? Yeah, it, it just occurred to me that uh, it's one thing to tie a particular pattern but it might be interesting and helpful to a lot of people to have a, an evening on technique and to try to pick out particular problems that are troublesome <clears throat> in fly tying and see if we can demonstrate different ways of solving them. For example, I could show you three different ways to use big feathers to tie small soft tackles. Um, Tying small soft tackles is a problem because you run out of small feathers. Well, it's possible to use big feathers and I can show you three ways to do it. I could show you um, two different ways to make a rope out of a peacock hurl so that it won't be fragile anymore. Uh, when you wrap it on something like a Griffith's gnat, um, I can show you uh, a couple of different ways to get hackle so it's absolutely perfectly perpendicular if you're kind of anal about it. Now, those are just examples, but I know that every one of you have techniques that you've learned or you've developed that solve certain kinds of problems. And yeah. uh, I don't know, was it you, Jerry, who talked about your way of, of stripping the fuzz off peacock curl for yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's just like when uh, with, with John's uh, uh, tying off a dry fly hackle, he pulls it out to the front. I pull it. I pull it back against the thread. And I find I it it works very well that way. It, you, you actually end up tying right down on stem, you know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've been probably this last year because of, you know, without the shows. As I'm tying, I'm realizing there there are issues that that I'm that I'm finding as you know, and I I I, I, I do pretty well, and I find things that well, if I just tweak that a little bit, it makes the whole process easier. You know, John yeah. John Kreft uh, showed one the other night that I use tonight. When you or tying on sparkle on hair, you clip it off before you tie it on. Yeah, I, I do that. I do that with almost every hair wing I tie. I, I do too. And that just makes an enormous difference. And it occurred to me that a bunch of us who tie a lot, uh, Al Beatty's got a whole bunch of these. Oh, yeah. Um, we've all got techniques like that that solve problems. Why not have a program where instead of me doing the whole program, I do 10 minutes of it, you do 10 minutes of it, Al does 10 minutes of it, 
and each of us show ways to uh, to, to do a couple a, of things. Yeah, a particular problem. It just struck me it'd be helpful to people. Yeah. Well, well I was yeah I was explaining Sherry the other night. It it, it has to do with uh, with wading wading a bobbin. Yeah, I I don't do too much Atlantic salmon, but I still do. I I do. I, I still have the materials to do the bodies, and that I don't have the, the wing feathers anymore. I just I, I just stopped. It was getting so hard for me to to get the materials. But yeah. you know, so what I found is I still do a lot of D wings, uh, layback wings and stuff. And I found that if I put up of some weights inside the spool of the bobbin and keep the bobbin weighted, then I can really eliminate thread wraps i can put four on to really get it hold then i can wrap off the two but while those four are sitting there while i'm preparing material again that weighted bobbin is really holding the the, the thread pretty tight it is really interesting the difference you can really see if you walk away and you come back and you pull on something with four wraps you can pull down and you can squeeze it again especially if you're playing with with hair which which expands back on your wraps on you well you know? let's do that this uh winter well, the, the next series, yeah. I, I think this has been successful enough uh, to where we've had a good, uh, solid participation at every class. And I think we just keep uh, planning for this next series uh, when we're done with this one. Uh, we'll keep planning all year and uh, come up with some ideas. And yeah. I li like this multiple uh, technique uh, issues which would be good uh, i want to well i want to talk about next week and uh, <laughs> next week because uh one of our presenters uh couldn't make it and jerry needed to get a brand new computer <laughs> so i had to <laughs> so we have to juggle things around a little bit so uh next week uh on the on may april 8th uh i'm going to tie some uh uh, emerger pattern, a little tiny emerger from uh, from Dry Fly Innovations, and it's a series, so they're different colors. But I have a technique that I've developed for handling hackle, when the hackle is only less than an eighth of an inch long. It's really tiny. So this is another technique that I have shared with uh, the other a few of the other ladies here. So don't steal my show. So we're going to start that for next week, and then uh, then on the April fifteenth, uh, Jerry Coviello is going to teach uh, moose mane emergers, and then on the twenty second, Jim Ferguson is scheduled to do his caddis patterns, and Jerry, I have put you on April 29th, which, in effect, would normally be our last class. I'm going to have you. Uh, uh, you'll be ready to do your soft tackle uh, techniques and stuff for, for uh, the very last class. Okay. And uh, I think that'll be good. And if we decide we want to do a couple of more, uh, I'm still open on May 6th and May 13th if we want to do that. So uh, anybody else have any other questions? No, uh, I'm going to, uh, nope, I'm going to head to dinner. Yeah. So Dick, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks Dick. And, thank you. Uh, I'll be Bye, everybody. Goodbye, thank everybody, you. and thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Good night, Cherry. Good night.